hey, hey, friend. Welcome back to the YouTube channel for the Renaissance English History Podcast, the original Tudor History Podcast going since 2009. I am your host, Heather, and this channel is where I put all of my old episodes and new episodes from all of my different shows, as well as lots of other content like this video right here. So it is International Women's Day today. Uh, we're in the middle of Women's History Month, International Women's Day. Today we are going to have a, a talk about women in the arts and literary patrons and just how women contributed to the music arts scene in Tudor England. And then at the end, I'm going to have a little bit of creative advice for women who want to start creative projects. It's going to be a new section called Heather Rants About Things. I did a rant earlier this week, too. I'm going to have like a little rant about creativity. So it's going to be Heather's rant, but in a supportive way, if that makes sense. All right. Let us get into it. That was like so vague, right? So vague. But here we go. You got to stay. You got to stay to the end to hear it. OK, so. The Tudor Elizabethan period, of course, was famous for its flowering of literature, of music. There was, you know, the Elizabethan golden age of fill in the blank, you name it. It's actually how I got into Tudor history. Gosh, 30 years ago, more than that, in my high school chamber choir. I know I don't look like I could have been in high school 30 years ago. Um, I started high school when I was two, basically. Yeah. Um, so in my high school chamber choir, we sang William Byrd's Ave Verum Corpus. And my chamber choir director made some comment about how William Byrd was a Catholic and he was writing in the court of Elizabeth, who was Protestant, and how that must have been hard for him and something about a recusant Catholic. And I remember thinking, like, what is this recusant Catholic? Like, something about that really appealed to my inner two-year-old rebel at the time. And so I started learning about what recusant Catholics were. And uh, I, you know, learned about it. And that was how I got into Tudor history. So it was through one of the arts and cultures and music and all of that that was my, my entree to Tudor history. Of course, this is also right in the center of the, the Renaissance and the blossoming of all of these different types of, of arts and music. And one of the things also that I find so exciting about this period is you know, after however many centuries of living with this life was simply a rehearsal for the hereafter, we start to see this rise in people saying, you know what, I can sing just to sing. I can make beautiful music because I can write just because it doesn't have to be for God. It doesn't have to be for this practice for the next life. I can enjoy this life. I think it must have been such an exciting time to be alive, to be making art, to be to be doing all of that. I just did. Goosebumps, you guys, it gives me goosebumps. Anyway. Within this cultural renaissance, women often get overlooked by their male counterparts. And yet women were right there, of course, participating in it as patrons, as participants themselves, as artists. And so today we are going to talk about some of those women and how they did participate in the art and cultural scene of Tudor and Elizabethan England. So, of course, a woman's engagement with the arts was bound by very strict societal expectations and rules and restrictions. And despite these limitations, many women still found avenues through which they could express their creativity and they could participate in the cultural life of their time. They often participated in the arts through less public, yet also profoundly influential ways. There were artistic mediums like embroidery which was not only a domestic skill, but was also a very deep, profound form of artistic expression. Music also offered a respectable outlet for women. Many women were expected to learn how to play the lute or the virginals within the confines of their home or court. They still had this musical outlet. Literature was a little bit trickier for women to participate in because of restrictions on women's education. But they still found ways. People like Mary Sidney Herbert, who was the Countess of Pembroke, hosted salons and literary events at her house at Wilton House. We also see many poets and playwright. Last month, we talked a little bit about Amelia Lanier, who was one of the early Tudor women poets. 
So there were still women who were doing this, who found ways to participate in this cultural flowering of literature, even within the confines of the lack of education that women had. Noble women in Tudor and Elizabethan England wielded considerable influence over this flowering of culture as patrons and patronesses, I suppose. And it started with the queen who built a court that was just a hub of music, of arts. She granted patents for publishing. She granted a patent to William Byrd to be able to publish music exclusively. So she really did a lot to support musicians and artists. Of course, Shakespeare, you think about her court and the plays. And all of that was because she wanted to have a court that was the center of, of this kind of cultural flowering. And she wanted to support musicians and, and artists. There were also other noble women. We talked about Mary Sidney Herbert. There was also Margaret Clifford, the Countess of Cumberland, who, again, at her home, hosted salons and uh, literary events where people could present new writings. And I have to sneeze. I don't know where it went. Uh, where people could present new writings, new works, share ideas, kind of riff back and forth with each other. Just really these places where artists could come together and and share their ideas. And we would call it network, I suppose, and uh, and be creative with each other. Margaret Clifford actually also uh, was a patron of Amelia Lanier, who I just talked about, this early poet. In the realm of visual arts, women's contributions were often relegated to the sphere of domestic duties, but they were still profound and multifaceted. Embroidery, like I said, was a skill that was taught to all women from a young age and it was not merely a domestic task, but it did allow women to have this artistic expression. They were able to weave their narratives, their beliefs, their aesthetic sensibilities into these beautiful, intricate designs. These embroidered pieces ranging from household items to elaborate tapestries were laden with symbolism and they were testament to the skill and the craftsmanship and the creativity really of their makers. There were also visual artists. Lavina Tierlink is one who stands out as a very remarkable figure. She was a miniaturist, and actually I've done episodes on her. She came to the Tudor court after Hans Holbein. Interestingly, she was paid more than Hans Holbein, which is something that people don't always remember. So she actually got more money than Hans Holbein did. She broke so many conventional boundaries. So she was a woman who she had a husband, but she was brought over to England uh, to, to be a court painter. And her husband actually came with her. So it's something that even now, I think women who are headhunted and offered jobs uh, that involve moving, it has, it's kind of not as common as it is for men, really. You can imagine even back then in the 16th century, how uncommon it would have been for a woman to have been offered a job to come to England to be the court painter. And there her husband is coming along. She also had a child. So she really defied a lot of the kind of gender norms uh, of her period. And like I said, she was paid more than Hans Holbein, which I just think is a wonderful fact. And she painted under Henry VIII, uh, Mary, uh, Edward, and Edward Mary, and also Elizabeth. So I think that's really cool. And she's got beautiful miniatures. I've done some episodes on her and some other talks on her. I will uh, find a way to link to them. Women's literary contributions at this period um, might be slightly less visible, but they're no less vibrant. Women's writings at this time, whether poetry or prose, generally found an audience in private circles rather than in the public sphere. Again, that was social restrictions. Women were, really weren't supposed to be publishing their works. Anne Askew, of course, she's famous for having been a Protestant who was one of the final you know, martyrs of Henry VIII. She wrote beautifully poignant ballads. She was a poet. They articulated her spiritual turmoil, her personal turmoil, and they offer a very rare window of the female experience of personal faith and also prosecution during that time. For example, when she was in Newgate Prison, she wrote and sang a ballad uh, that goes, Faith is that weapon strong which will not fail at need. My foes, therefore among, therewith will I proceed. As it had in strength and force of Christ's way, it will prevail at length, though all the devils say nay. Faith in the Father's old obtained right wiseness. 
which make me very bold to fear no world's distress. I now rejoice in heart and hope bid me to do so, for Christ will take my part and ease me of my woe. And it goes on from there. So I'm not going to read it all, but really kind of expressing her experience of being held in jail for her religious beliefs. And then, of course, she was executed. So that's Anne Askew. It's something that's often overlooked when you talk about Anne Askew. You know, there's that she was the only woman racked. And there's all this kind of stuff that you hear about her that's quite sensational. But she actually was a poet, too. And and her poetry, you can look it up and read it online. It's quite beautiful and, and poignant. There was also Lady Mary Roth, who wrote, at the beginning of the 17th century, she wrote uh, a poem called Rania, a pastoral romance that was actually, like I said, a romance that talked about the complexities of love and courtly life, but also managed to subtly critique the constraints that were on women. And then there was Anne Locke. She wrote at the end of the 16th century, and she was a Calvinist. So she wrote about theology. She translated different biblical passages. She's also been called the first English author to publish a sonnet sequence. It was called A Meditation of a Penitent Sinner in 1560. Um, so these women, among others, were able to navigate the kind of constrictions, constrictions, constrictive landscape of their time. Their writings often acting as sort of subtle rebellions against some of the constraints that they saw. Music and performance in the Tudor period were actually something that women could participate in quite publicly. Women were able to perform. Like I said, they were expected to play the lute, the virginal, different instruments. It was also okay for women to compose. I love saying that. That's funny. It was also considered okay for women to compose. So even Queen Elizabeth had composed some music. Noble women left their mark in the musical domain composing pieces. They were largely performed in intimate settings of their own little social circle, but it was something where their musical expression was celebrated. And while we don't really seem to have records of very many women composers in the Tudor period, we definitely know of certain women who were known for their musical abilities, and that's something that was expected of them. And then, of course, there's the whole impact of the Reformation with all of these new belief systems that were coming into England. Women like Catherine Parr, who was the first woman in England to publish under her own name with her, her books on uh, prayers and meditations. So the Reformation actually gave women this outlet through which they could publish their own interpretations of things. And I think I talked in another video about what was really cool with the Protestant Reformation and it emphasis on having a direct relationship with God was that it led to this rise in literacy. So by the end of the 16th century, we see a lot more women writing. We see a lot more women diarists. But even earlier, women, like I said, Catherine Parr, were able to write if they were educated. They were able to, to do some translations. And, and that was something that was expected of women, especially Protestant women. So there we have it, a little overview of Tudor women in the arts. So where there were a lot of expectations, of constraints, of, of societal expectations on how much women would participate, especially in the public world of the arts. But there were still plenty of opportunities for women to participate in the private sphere uh, within their own homes, even within like embroidery with these domestic duties that they could have cultural expression or creative expression out of as well. So there we go. So now I'm going to have my little rant on creativity that I promised would come. I have noticed more often, I don't know why it's suddenly on my radar, but more often people kind of saying things like, oh, this musician sucked me, partially like backlash against Taylor Swift. And I don't know, it just seems to be something that's entering my consciousness more than it did in the past. Maybe I hear it from my daughter and things that kids say, just saying things like, oh, this artist sucks or that musician sucks or whatever. And, you know, it really bothers me because it's it's one of the reasons why people don't create because they're afraid of having that come to them. And I have experienced it on this channel. The One of the very early comments I got, this was years ago on one of my YouTube channels, and this is leading to where I'm going, I promise was this person wrote a comment that said, you're very boring and you talk too much. And 
it was so funny because I've also learned to not have notifications turned on for comments and things like that because I remember so clearly I was my daughter's really little I think I was like feeding her or something she was super little and I remember my phone going off and you know at some point I looked at it I was like oh what's this a little YouTube notification oh that's cool what is it you talk too much and you're really boring I thought well that's lovely <laughs> and so then I was curious like who, who does that like what, what person thinks it's a good idea to stop what they're doing in life and write something mean to someone else? Like, what's the thought process? And so I looked at their profile and, you know, they had not created any video themselves, any, anything there. And that's what usually happens. Usually the people who write the most mean things, 98%, the people who are the mean people, you look at their profile and they don't actually have anything. They've never posted anything themselves I love it because sometimes people write me things saying that I pronounced words wrong and then I'll just say like why don't you start a channel just teaching people how to pronounce words since it seems to be something you care about like just just do it instead of like spending your time on other people's stuff telling them how they're wrong just do something just make a video telling people how to pronounce things if that's you know that important to you so anyway it was funny because I looked at this person who told me that I was boring and I talked too much and I looked at their their profile and they didn't have any video what they did have was a bunch of playlists that they've created they had created of other videos to show their grandkids and I remember thinking wow so you're a grandparent look like a grandmother so you're a grandmother and you love your grandkids obviously enough that you're putting together these playlists of of cool little kids shows to to show them when they're at your house or whatever like is being mean to strangers who are creating things on the internet, is that part of those videos that you would be showing to them? Is that one of the lessons? Because I think probably not. I, I'm guessing that's a no. And I just wrote something back to that effect of like, you know, I'm so confused because you seem like a decent person. You seem like a nice person. You, you probably You're probably a nice person. And yet this is like what you do. You stopped what you were doing long enough to leave that like isn't time more precious than that to you <laughs> right and it was funny because then she wrote back and she said oh you know I'm sorry I need to remember there's other people that are reading this like yeah duh <laughs> okay like I'm a person I'm not a I'm not a robot I don't think I'm a robot yet so there was that and it reminds me of this is the story I'm going to tell so let's have a story time with Heather on creativity it's like in a sporting event where there are people playing on the field. Let's say they're playing soccer or football if you're, you know, the rest of the world. So they're playing soccer slash football and they're on the field and they're kicking the ball and they're doing all the plays and they're doing all the soccer slash football things. So those are the players. And then in the stand, there's the people in the stands. Those people in the stands are oftentimes yelling things. And I see it, we go to a lot of baseball games. I see it at the baseball games. You suck. You can't see. How could you miss that? What's wrong with your eyes? Blah, 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 this kind of stuff, right? Now, here's my question to you. Who do you think is contributing more to the sport? Who do you think is happier? Who do you think is more fulfilled in their life? Who do you think at the end of the day rests easier? The person who is playing? who is actually doing what their soul calls them to do, who's actually putting in the work, who is out there potentially exposing themselves to criticism, who is being very public in their playing so that everybody can see, right? So they're taking the risk of being out there, but at the same time, they're playing. They are doing what their soul calls them to do, what their skills and their abilities and all of that have called them to do. They're doing it versus the person in the stand who's just spouting opinions who do you think sleeps better at the end of the day I would say that it's the person who's playing and this is what I told my daughter because she's telling me about different things when people classmates and stuff say that people suck and I say you know look here's the thing when you're out on the field you do expose yourself to that you expose yourself to people saying you suck. You expose yourself to people saying you're boring and you talk too much. You expose yourself to all of that. And you're actually creating something. 
Like you're actually doing it. The person who's in the stands, who's shouting and who's being a jerk, they aren't creating anything. At the end of the day, they go home and what have they done with their day? The person on the field goes home and they've played a game. They've provided entertainment. They've competed. They've participated with teammates. They've done like some cool things with the day. The person who's just sat in the stand and complained, maybe they've like gotten drunk and like that's what they've done. They got drunk and yelled at players because that's fulfilling, right? So this is what I told my daughter. And I said, you know, obviously doing stuff takes puts you, make it's public. People can say, th- say things about you. And at the end of the day, what are we here for if not to create? What are we here for if not to let our souls shine? When we reach the end of our life, when I reach the end of my life, I'm going to be able to look back and say, I did some pretty cool things. And I was boring and talked too much, <laughs> right? And my hope for every woman on International Women's Day and every person is that if there is creativity in you, if there is the urge to create something, anything, you do not get scared or put off or let the people in the stands win because they are not creating. They are not putting in the work. They are not the ones who are leaving anything of substance to the world. They're just showing what it is to be a hater. And yay for them. Hooray. Congratulations. What else can I say about this? Do you guys like this? Do you like me sharing my creative opinions? Because I'm thinking about doing this more often, mostly because I have a lot of these discussions with my daughter and, uh, you know, things that she hears and picks up and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm thinking about doing like a weekly little Heather rants kind of thing like this at the end of at the end of my videos. But yeah, you can either be somebody who's on the field who's actually playing or you can be somebody who's in the stands who's shouting. And maybe you're shouting support. And maybe if that is your role and that's what you want to do, be in the stands and shout support, right? The one other thing that I think is interesting is you never see those players shouting abuse at each other, right? Because and the same thing with artists. You never see artists say to, say to each other, like, you suck, because they know what it takes. They, you might say, well, this person's art doesn't resonate with me. And that's perfectly valid. There's art that I don't get. There's music that I don't get. It's not my, my thing. And I would never, ever, but never say that person sucks, because I know what it took for them to make that music. I know what it took for them to put themselves out there. I know what it took like for them to be vulnerable and to share a piece of their soul with me. And so I'm going to, I'm going to like appreciate that even if it's not my thing. And I'm not going to say they suck, right? Same thing with the people on the field versus in the stand. The people who are the players, they know what it takes. So the people who are saying you suck, they, A, they have no idea what they're doing and they have no idea what it takes. And that's what they're doing with their life is complaining instead of actually like being on the field playing. So I ask you, do you, if you are somebody who wants to be on the field playing, I ask you, I request of you that you do that, that you do that this week, that you do that this month during Women's History Month on International Women's Day. I especially request of you that you don't let the people in the stands yelling stop you and that you get out there and you get on the field and you be vulnerable and you share your stuff and you share your stuff with the world because you have a voice and you were given a voice. And and if you feel that urge to create, it was given to you and it would be an insult to whatever power it is that gave it to you to not use it because you were given to it for a reason. So it's not your job to question it. It's just your job to just, just create, just create YouTube videos, podcasts, right? I don't care. Just embroidery, play music, stand up comedy. Just, just create, just create something. Just the world needs more creators. So that's all I can say about that. Heather is done ranting. <laughs> I hope this was at all useful. All right, I'm going to stop now. I've talked long enough. If any of this was enjoyable to you and you're still here, I sure would appreciate a press and saddle like button. And I hope I earned your subscription to my channel where I put out all kinds of random videos. Happy International Women's Day, you guys and ladies and people, people of all kinds. And uh, thanks for watching. 
I appreciate you. I know that your time is valuable. I know that YouTube throws all kinds of stuff at you. And there's so many things you could be doing with your time right now. And you chose to just do whatever we just did. I'm not sure what that was, but we did. We got through it. And, and hopefully there was something of value in there. All right, my friends, I will speak with you very, very soon. <laughs> bye bye.